I'm Claudine Close. I'm the president of Historic Red Hook, and we are really privileged to host this program. I thought, and I apologize for putting all these speakers on the hot seat, but this fireplace is the best place to, to, to oh. put people in this room. Um, just a couple of words about Historic Red Hook. When uh, Brent first mentioned this idea of, of hosting this panel and featuring Francesco's work, I thought this is a great opportunity for Historic Red Hook to highlight the, the intersection, explore the intersection of agriculture and farming and history. It's, um, Red Hook is a wonderful place to do this because farming has been so important to its history. So I know Francesco has reached back into history in the methods he's used. The farmers have reached back into history as far as the kind of farming that they're, they're doing. And so we reached back into our collections a little bit just to pull out of some of the work of farmers and observers from the turn of the century, 1899 to 1902, who illustrated with their cameras, and this was dry plate, glass plate negative, but dry plate, um, scenes from Red Hook. And it's interesting because one of them was a farmer, William Peter, who owned a farm in Upper Red Hook. And uh, I think it was fairly unusual at the time, but he would, took an interest in farming because not many photographers then were interested in the operations of farming. So you'll see some scenes, and you can examine them later, of uh, what farming was like in Red Hook at the time, interestingly enough, in 1902, you'll see some spraying going on, so I don't know about that one, but uh, they, they had started doing some spraying. Uh, the other photographer, Harriet Martin Day, um, unusual for the time because she was a woman interested in photography, actually visited Red Hook. She was of the Martin family, a very important Red Hook family. Um, and she was born outside, but was visiting her family in the summer of 1899. She too documented all these wonderful scenes of farming in Red Hook. So we feel very fortunate to have these two large collections of glass plate negatives upstairs in our archives, um, documenting what farming was like. So I can see it's a, it's a good backdrop for what's going to happen here. So um, just one more word, if anybody would like to join Historic Red Hook, we do have um, our membership forms here. This is the merger of the Historical Society <coughs> and the Friends of Elmendor, the group that saved this wonderful building. If anybody's interested in a tour afterwards, I'm happy to give them a tour. Let me come talk in. But without further ado, I just I'm going to turn it to Francesco Mastalia to moderate this wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Um, anyway, my name is Francesco Mastalia, and I've spent the last three years working on a book project, which uh, some of you might have seen, which is titled Organic. Over these, over these three years, I've traveled over 17,000 miles in the Hudson Valley to photograph and interview 136 of its farmers and chefs. Now, all of the photographs were taken using the wet plate collodion process, which is a process that goes, uh, it was even earlier than the dry plates. It actually started in the 1850s, and it went through the 1880s, and then the dry plate appeared. But as I like to say, during the 1850s, all of our food was organic. In fact, during that time, 80% of Americans lived on farms. Also, as part of this project, I videotaped interviews of all of the farmers and chefs. So all of the text in the book is derived from, from the interview. So everything is in their own words. And working on this project, I was quite surprised as to what I heard. I've always supported the organic label. I still do, but uh, again, I was surprised to hear what I did. I didn't expect it. Um, I took a very documentary approach, so I didn't come at it from, from any angle. I wanted the people to tell their own stories, because I find if we see now, everything seems to be organic. It's the biggest buzzword in food. Besides our fruits and vegetables, baby food is organic. Pet food is organic. Beauty supplies are organic. We have organic dry cleaners. We have organic window cleaner. Even lollipops are organic. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I think they're organic lollipops. So people are spending more money on this word. And I think it's a word that we've all come to trust. I mean, when I think of organic, I would think it's something that is free of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. It's partly true. It's true sometimes. Other times it's not. 
One thing I found about this word is that it's very confusing. Sometimes you can go to a farmer's market and you'll see a farmer does not have an organic sign up and you ask him, is this organic? He might turn and say, well, I use organic practices, but I'm not certified. So I bet you wonder, well, why not? Why don't you just certify? Or if you go into a supermarket and you see USDA organic, and then it says product of China. <laughs> that I don't understand either. So, so anyway, there is so much confusion around this word. But again, if I have a choice between buying organic and non-organic, I would, I would still buy organic. But if I can go to a farmer's market and buy kale from a local farmer, it doesn't matter if they have organic kale in the supermarket. But again, something like bananas, which we can't grow in this area, if I have a choice between organic and non-organic, I'm going to buy the organic. Um, I'm going to let the panel, let them describe what the word organic means to them. Um, it's a fascinating word. It's a fascinating word to, to come across. And uh, what I did find is that the meaning is determined by who you're speaking with. Because you're going to hear something different from different people. To hear it from a farmer, let's say in the Hudson Valley, you might have a small family farm as opposed to a big organic industrial farm in California. You're going to get a very different definition. Uh, we have a great panel of diverse people uh, coming from very different backgrounds. And uh, it's good to, to hear it from, from a different group. Um, we have one of our local favorites. From Bayside, Queens. <laughs> Born in Brooklyn. The world started in Brooklyn. <laughs> but he came to the Hudson Valley. In fact, he came here in the 1980s. And he bought 90-some acres in Tivoli, where he started raising animals. Uh, his farm has grown quite a bit since then. Uh, Rich has almost been... Double. Almost double. Rich has been raising cattle, pigs, chickens, turkeys, specialty fowl. It's, it's a family farm. Uh, his products are very in demand from, from chefs in the areas, from consumers. And he's, he's, he's a great farmer. He's a person who just really has a tremendous amount of respect for, for animals. And um, he has a very interesting take. He says, I don't care what the customer wants. I do it because that's what I want, that the animal needs to be raised the right way, the proper way, under the right conditions, with the right food, and he says, I'm selfish that way. So, and I, I, I respect him for that. Um, next, we have Laura Pinzero from Gigi's Hudson Valley. Of course, probably so many of us know her from her restaurant, from her book, uh, Hudson Valley Mediterranean. Laura went to the French Culinary Institute. She's a cookbook author, nutrition and culinary consultant. She's a registered dietitian. She's a health educator and an Eat Local industry spokesperson. In 2005, Oprah Magazine named Laura one of the five most gifted and giving food professionals for her work as a nutrition and culinary educator. She is a strong supporter of uh, uh, Hudson Valley farmers and food artisans, and she's a strong advocate of eating locally, seasonally, and healthy. Next, we have Leona Woods, and uh, I think this is a great voice to hear, Liana is the executive director of the National Organic Coalition. For the past 20 years, she's been running down to Washington, trying to kick some butt, get this word organic to, to mean what, what it means. But the National Organic Coalition is a national alliance of organizations. They work to provide a voice in Washington for farmers, ranchers, environmentalists, consumers, and industry members involved in organic agriculture. Basically, they serve as a watchdog for the organic label, and uh, Leanna is always there fighting that fight. So you can always see her conferences or in Washington, and it'll be interesting to see what she goes through on, on the policy end. Next, we have another one, Red Hook's own Ethel Barone, another Brooklyn, Brooklynite here. They're all coming up here, Richard. I told you they started there. We escaped. <laughs> So, um, she's been farming Red Hook Farms, which is a 34-acre farm with her husband, Tom, for the past 14 years. Red Hook Farm, they sell to high-end restaurants, including Mercado and Red Hook and Terrapin in, uh, in Rhinebeck. Uh, some of the other places are Murray's and Tivoli, another fork in the road. 
So a lot of the a lot of the local chefs support her, and I remember a few of the chefs told me about her. And each time they mentioned her name, a big smile came to their faces. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Ethel, she'd pull up with her truck to the back door of the restaurant in the middle of the afternoon. Food she just pulled out of the ground, and all of a sudden her menus would change. <laughs> but uh, she's a very highly respected farmer for years. She and her husband, most of the food that they raised, they donated to support homeless people living with HIV and people recovering from addiction. In fact, they would donate nearly 400 pounds of produce per week in order to do this. Ethel speaks adamantly about not spraying anything on the food she is growing because they're growing mainly to feed those who most need the healing and rehabil rehabilitative offerings of clean food. So, uh, Ethel, thanks for being here. Okay. Next, we have Jennifer Brizzi of Red Hook, right? Of Rhinebeck. Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck, right? Rhinebeck, Rhinebeck. Good, we're neighbors. Neighbors, and we're both Italian. She's been writing for, about food for nearly 20 years. She worked as a licensed practical nurse for 11 years and has been a writer and editor on health topics. Currently, she is the healthy eating educator at the Mother Her store, Storehouse in Poughkeepsie and Kingston, where she teaches nutrition education and gives healthy cooking demonstrations. So as you can see, we have quite a diverse panel here. Um, Diana, you know, I'd actually like to start with you about um, tell us your experience of, you know, you've been you've been trying to uh, to get this word to mean something on a political and uh, standpoint. Could you share some of what you do? Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say that um, I have been growing my own food um, and uh, buying from local farmers since about 1979. So I truly believe in local um, food. Uh, at the heart of how we eat. Um, but I also truly believe in organic, and um, for about 20 years I've been uh, working on food policy to try and change the um, structure of agriculture, food and agriculture in the U.S. And since about 1997, working um, to really uh, keep the orga organic um, standards, uh, the law was written in 1990, the standards started being written in 97, and when they first came out with them, it included allowing genetic engineering, irradiation, and uh, sewage sludge. Um, and so we fought that. There were actually a lot of other things wrong with the rule, at that, the rule which are the regulations around the law at that time, and we fought until 2002 when the actual label, USDA label came out. But um, I'll say, I'll uh, paraphrase one of our founding fathers that says uh, democracy, um, uh, the price of democracy is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. it, it takes, for any law and regulation, um, you have to fight, keep fighting for it. And so what we do in our coalition, which includes um, many farmers groups, including the Northeast Organic Farming Association groups and other farming groups around the country, and it also includes Consumer Reports and Union of Concerned Scientists and environmental groups like Center for Food Safety and Beyond Pesticides and a uh, few other groups. We actually hire a lobbyist um, for a part-time, a wonderful guy who fights for good food, all um, in his other clients as well, um, to really advocate for, to keep those standards um, strong. Uh, they, what it is, are, there's a set of very well-defined standards under a law that was written um, Originally, the farmers around the country agreed to this law, um, not realizing that it would put a huge um, pressure on them to, uh, do, uh, to comply. But the law was written with, uh, that said these standards could allow some synthetics, but every synthetic used in organic <coughs> gets reviewed by a citizen board um, and has to be re-reviewed for use every five years. So there's lots of room for democracy there, for people to, twice a year you can uh, uh, write public comments about whether you want to see that synthetic used or not. Um, at the same time that we as citizens supporting local food and good quality food uh, can have our say, so can big industry. And that's, that there is the tension of what happens. Um, and so what we fight for is that uh, the reason synthetics were allowed, by the way, was to, uh, that some of them, like um, 
uh, some of the parts of baking powder are synthetic. Uh, so to allow certain things in organic that could um, really increase the, um, the marketplace for organic, make more products available that were organic. And, and then the, the way the regulation works, every five years you have to review it. Is there something not synthetic that could be replaced placing that? The thought having been that there would be increasing new products that would replace those things. Um, so I'm not going to talk for, um, I'm just going to give you one example of the types of things we do. Um, and in um, Francesco's book is uh, a story of John Gorzinski. Um, who is a wonderful farmer who sells, I think, at Union Square, and he's a really good um, orchardist. He um, grows uh, apples and other uh, orchard fruits. And he was uh, organic under the uh, NOFA New York, Northeast Organic Farming Association, before the law came in. But the law allowed, the regulation allowed um, antibiotics to be used on apples and pears during their bloom time, not on the fruit itself. Uh, which uh, to fight one disease, and it was very specific only um, for those uh, for that disease and only on the bloom. Uh, but John said, "I that's not organic, and I don't need that, and I can't I can't sign up for a label that allows that." And there and I there are a lot of stories in the book about that. We have actually since then this uh, this year and last year um, uh, fought really really hard. Uh, because because your app, most of your organic apples come from the Northwest, and they need uh, these antibiotics to fight fire blight this disease, and um, and they pushed really hard. They feel they can't do without it, and we got antibiotics out of organic uh, uh, in the past two years because of that review process. So I'd like to leave you with the idea: it is a very strong label. There's nothing, no other part of your food supply that you can find out not just all the ingredients, but all the processing aids and things used to grow your food. It's completely transparent, and it is also democratic in that it asks for your input twice a year. But we have to keep fighting for it. And in the end, it is about uh, knowing how your, how your farmer grows. And if for the people who can't get to their farmer, to meet a farmer, uh, don't they deserve to have food that is grown without uh, largely without um, any toxics and um, synthetics that are very carefully reviewed every five years. Don't, don't they deserve to have that? And, but we also know that local food grown by the farmers you know, that you hear from and you've seen you can meet, is the freshest and best way. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I'm going to follow up on that. I did, we're very fortunate in the Hudson Valley that we have access to farmers whether we go to the farm directly at a farm stand or at a farmer's market. And as she just mentioned, I mean, I grew up in New Jersey. We didn't live around farms. I mean, the only place we can buy food is a supermarket. So again, if I had a choice between one or the other, like I said, I go to the farmer's market and if I can't find, uh, what, and it's mostly fruits because we can grow. We're growing a lot of things that people <coughs> feel that we can't even grow here. Uh, you know, if I can go to Richard's farm to buy a chicken, there's no way I'm going to go to a supermarket and go buy one. Um, but a point that I want to make with the organic labeling now are different. There are different uh, different labelings. We have 100% organic, where all the ingredients must be certified organic. We have organic, in which all agricultural ingredients must be certified, except where specified on the national list. And then made with organic. And that's, and that's 95 percent. Must be 95 percent. Can you just explain what what is the national list? The national list is that list of um, synthetic materials that are allowed, and there are a couple of natural materials that are prohibited that have been voted on voted to be prohibited as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that national list is the place you can see what those synthetics are. And so the 95 percent label, um, for instance, sugar. I fought actually really hard about this 95% label because I believe that they, sh uh, there's also the made with, you were going to say, and I interrupted you. There's a made with yeah. label of 70%. Which is, yeah, at least 70% of the product must be certified organic. So, so the 5%, um, the um, first of all, can never be genetically modified, irradiated, or sewage sludge. Um, none of the 5%. The 5%, though, like sugar, um, needs an anti-caking agent or 
um, you can't use it. The sugar would be solid block. So um, I wanted to say on that 5%, put it on the label. And then they said, you've got to have a label that says um, sugar made with organic sugar, and no one will understand, because it's <clears throat> the anti-caking agent is not an ingredient. It is, it is uh, processed use. Uh, it is a, there is a material, but it's in such tiny amount that it's not considered an ingredient. Your ingredients labels don't tell you everything that's in your food. It's just the ingredients. Anyway, so the list is what's the public place of what those synthetics are that are allowed in organic. Only those on that list are allowed. Well, where is that available? Is that that, on the website for the USDA National Organic Program. Okay, you so it's easy. It. Is it understandable? No. <laughs> are you kidding me? I, never, I could never figure out. Uh, I mean, it is if you know chemistry. Yeah, well, that just say, I always find, you know, I'm a fanatic about reading labels. When I go into a supermarket, you spend 10 minutes reading boxes and reading things. There are more ingredients you have no idea what they are than you do know what they are. So, um, you know, again, perfectly fine. They're just natural in ingredients, but it's hard for the consumer to identify what's a natural ingredient versus what is a synthetic chemical. Correct, correct. I mean, I think. Uh, I read recently that they are trying to do away with the nat the natural label because it's so abstract. And the Consumer Reports um, just came out with a survey about natural um, that the consumers actually believe that it's the same as as organic. Yet there are no absolutely no standards or definition of natural. Mm -hmm. So it could be anything. But consumers, about ninety five percent of the consumers they surveyed said um, it was uh, they were considered the same exact. Um, uh, parameters yeah, please do. Okay, the all natural label, which originally that's what my label says, all natural, which mm -hmm. I thought was all natural, right? You know, whatever your definition before, <laughs> organic labels were legal on meat anyway. And um, there was an article um, in the New York Times uh, what the poultry industry does with, the, you know, how they raise the poultry. And, and, the, and a lady brought it to my attention. She says, you know, uh, Brand X, which I won't mention. Uh, withholds the drugs one week before slaughter. So I said, well, now I'm not knocking my head against the wall, trying to, you know, even though these are big corporations, and I always wonder why I can't get my price point down to what they do. But understandingly, that we run a farm and our slaughterhouse is handheld. You know, it's four people doing it. It's not a shackle system, which is automated, so you can, you know, so that cuts your cost. And they raise that millions a week, and we raise, uh, so that I understood. So then I went to the USDA when because USDA comes in and inspects my place and checks it. And I said, wait a minute, you know, they're they're using drugs on an all natural label. Oh yeah. What do you mean, oh yeah? <laughs> he says, Well, we don't care what you feed them on an all natural label. And this is back probably in the eighties or late eighties. And I says, so what does all natural mean? I'm assuming, like everybody else, <laughs> And he says, all it means is they didn't put salt or pepper or butter, salt, pepper, and butter. In and we don't care what they feed them. That's what all natural means. Okay, on poultry. I mean, you know, that, that changes with every type of item you possibly could have. So what they're saying is true. The all natural label is, um, I don't know. As salt is natural, isn't it? <laughs> well, should, should our food be natural? I mean, does that need to be put on the label? I mean, natural as opposed to what? Unnatural. Unnatural. <laughs> well, well but, you know, there are, there are 20,000 varieties or types of drugs, medications that are fed to poultry. You know, I, I didn't know any of this. I, I raised chickens from five years old. I said the worst thing my parents done was to give me 50 chicks for Easter. Okay. And, you know, they didn't want me to be a farmer. <laughs> well, you know, they, they did it. They did that, okay? So, uh, I may have lived in Bayside, but I had a farm in Bayside, you know, I mean, I had raised everything there. So, I've been raising birds for forever, and uh, so it came natural for me to come here and, and, and start with that. And, um, but I also was at another end of, I tell a story, that I was about five years old, and I come home from school, Kindergarten, the first grade, there it was. And I go back in the backyard. I had uh, about the size of this table. Uh, my menagerie, I called it. As a kid, I go across the street and catch frogs and turtles and, you know, real Tom Sawyer. And I had a little area here with, with water and my goldfish are in there. And my father had this one lousy apple tree in that thing there. And I 
probably say that because he raised two apples to try to get the biggest apples going. And he sprayed it and he killed everything. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know? Your and, animals too? Well, yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. He didn't kill a tree. <laughs> that tree. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the toads didn't die, but the frog, the bullfrogs died, the, the fish died. And I'm up there, I remember coming to my father and I'm crying, you know, a little kid. And, What'd you do? And he was on the side of my house, and he was with his hand pump spray you know, <laughs> and his T-shirt. I, I could see him right now there, squatted over that thing, mixing the chemicals, whatever they were. And he's covered in it. You know, he's white with spray. And um, so that's what started me on that kind of thought. And, and then he did it a second time. And of course, I said to him, uh, you know, I started saying, you know, well, how did they have a hell? You know. Uh, and he says, well, you don't understand, before the Second World War, DDT was the best thing. He might have been using DDT for a while. And, um, because it was in the 50s. And, um, uh, so I'm looking at him and I go, Hawk, look at you. You're covered in that. <laughs> well, you don't understand. Chemical companies know <laughs> what they put in there. And it won't affect me or people. Okay? <laughs> this is not you know. So I says, well, it killed my bullfrogs and they're not insects, as he said, only and I says, and it killed the fish in the water. And really, that's what it is. It's in the water that, that transfers, as you know, as I know now. And later on, that the animals, the, the frogs, ingest water through their skin, which ingested the chemical, which killed them. The toads live, and the box turtles, and all that stuff. So, uh, and I, you know, so the second time it happened, I'm, I'm again in tears. And I said, I could put plastic over or whatever I was telling them at the time, you know, tell me in, in the future. So my teacher said, said, saw me, I guess, sad, whatever, and I explained what happened. And, and she says, oh, you should read a book. It's called Silent Spring. <laughs> and I guess from then on, I always had a out-of-the-box kind of look at things, you know. I mean, it, it, should you spray the apples? Yes. But, but there is, you know, I was in a florist business. Guess what I sold? Chemicals, right? As a young fellow, I worked for my father. And, and uh, talking about bananas, uh, bananas can be grown here. My okay. grandfather oh, grew the first bananas in Brooklyn. Can't grow them in the Hudson Valley, can't grow them in Brooklyn. Grown in Brooklyn. I have a plaque from uh, New York City, 1913, of bananas. So, anyway, it was one of the uh, magazines. Uh, so, that's what started me on it. And when I came here, I just wanted to raise food without drugs myself for antibiotics. And little by little, uh, a business arose from that. And it was amazing how all of a sudden I get a call, and I really started very small. And this guy calls me up, who I don't know who it is. And uh, he says, you know, you know who I am? I said, no. And he says, well, I'm the largest broiler producer in New York State, whoever that may be. So I says, OK. So he says, I'm here, and you're going to raise chickens without antibiotics. Well, I am, yeah. And he says, well, you can't do that. And I says, why? He says, it's impossible to do that. I says, nothing's impossible. It might be difficult. It might be, you know, then you have to take some precautions. But uh, whatever, you know, and that's the way I left it and never heard it. And, and, and now you see how that's kind of changed. That's some 30 years later, okay? And people all are thinking of that. The doctors are thinking of that, that maybe we're getting too much what I was saying all the while, that maybe... You know, by the time you're 30, which I'm all past that now, you you get a little bit from here, a little there, a little there, and then before you know it, when you're 30 years old, you've got all this in your system, and you can't. F I want that box when I need, it, yeah. you know, or steroids or whatever it takes to get me well. But if we constantly get in our system, and that's my belief. And uh, but labeling, well, it's another story. Well, do, do, do uh, consumers ask you? Do they come in and ask you? No, are you? Do they use that word organic? Do they ask you? No, well, you know, I, I guess at the farm market, I'm sure, you know, by now, who doesn't know Richie? So, um, you know, really. <laughs> but um, uh, they do ask, is this organic or whatever? And I says no. And, and for a while, we were doing sweet corn with an organic certification before the new regulations came in. And the, the company that was doing the, well when it came to doing the audit, you know, they were asking all kinds of questions, you know, going through this whole thing. They said, well, what happens when the weeds get too much? Well, we plow it under, you know, and I don't use herbicide. So that new regulation came in, and I guess the bookkeeping was too much for these farms. It was more of a volunteer type organization. 
So um, then when I checked with other ones, they, they want a percentage of my gross, they want this, so I don't need this label. And everybody knows the work going to call label. And the sweet corn is not a big money maker for me. So, and if you don't know that my corn was organic, when you see it chewed off at the top, <laughs> and you find a worm in there, and then some ladies would say, hey, there were two in there, so you owe me another 50 cents, because it's high in protein. You know? So that's what happens when you don't spray it at all. You know, whether you use organic spray or not, I just don't spray it. And I always wonder how I could ride around here in their other farms, and I don't see the blackbirds in their corn. Now, ask anybody to see my corn. It looks like the cartoons would all, you know, as soon as the corn gets at a certain level, the blackbirds go in there and I just, uh, you know, so I usually was picking 25% of my crop and they still would shoot up. So that answers itself. I tell people, take a look at my farm. If you see any weeds between the corn, you know, you'll see it. There's, it's all full of weeds, you know. And my son, I say, because I didn't go to agricultural school and know nothing about farming, people say, well, how do you do this? I say, well, I don't know. I know nothing about farming, you know. I just do things, and I don't. If you ask me all the, first of all, I don't know what, what chemicals are because I don't use them, okay. But my son who went to agricultural school comes back and he says, oh, this is ridiculous, the weeds are choking up my machinery, <laughs> you know, this is not efficient. I said, well, that's the way I do it, and that's all there is to it, and that's what people want, and you got to deal with it. You know, your yield is down, you know, all this. I says, I never played with numbers for, you know, because another thing was, when uh, I asked the farm extension to come and, and look at my fields, you know, I'm a real greenhorn. I don't know nothing. I'm telling you. Right? And um, he says, well, you know, if you put this chemical on, you'll get this more tonnage on your, your hay. So I go, okay. So then I calculate what that fertilizer would cost. And then I calculate what my manure costs. And I go, well, where, where am I ahead of the game? Because if I put another X amount of dollars into it to get X amount of bales, I'm still back at the same spot. It's just numbers. In other words, I'm getting whatever it is, you know, three tons of grain or feed off of an acre versus an, an, a ton and a half. But it's not costing me anything other than my labor. I can get talk enough. <laughs> Do you, are you certified in any way? No, not anymore. I don't, I don't bother. I've actually, then the organization that was doing organic, I should correct that. So I see they got a certified all natural. So I called them up. He says, why would you want to be certified from us? He says, we learned everything from you. I says, you what? He says, well, that's it. That time we went in, we says, you know what? We're going to change the whole thing to an all natural label and do what Richie's been doing. So why are we going to certify you? So, okay. Yeah. Well, Ethel, you are growing produce, yes. and um, you're not a certified organic farmer, correct? No, we're no. small. Was, was there a reason that you decided not to? Was that opportunity ever come, or did you think about it? I, I looked into it for many years. I, I would get the time in the winter, not in the summer, <laughs> to uh, do paperwork and look into it. And uh, I visited organic farms, and I noticed one year during the tomato blight they were spraying copper sulfate. So I read up on that, and I found out from other farmers that uh, copper sulfate stays in the soil, and high levels of copper in the soil mean that down the road, should I go to, into sheep raising, that's very toxic for sheep. And if somebody buys the land and develops it, which is what happens sooner or later in most places, the aquifer, those metals do not disappear. They, anything you put in that soil can go into someone's drinking water down the road, and I really don't want that on me. And when I looked at the other farms spraying the copper sulfate, these staffed young uh, apprentices uh, weren't wearing anything. All the tomato plants looked like evergreen trees, the color. And I, I would not eat a tomato from there regardless. Copper lodges in your brain, I read. And it causes a lot of health issues. So that was one of the things I noticed when I was looking into organic farming, uh, the certification. And the other thing was um, a lot of organic farmers were using something called neem oil. And so I looked up neem oil, and I'm a retired uh, respiratory therapist since I'm 40. I got started very late in farming <laughs> and escaped to the country and uh, never looked back, never went back.
And so the neem oil I read was a naturally occurring product in India, in a neem tree. And uh, I wanted to know how it worked because we have a lot of bees on our property and a lot of amphibians and a lot of wasps, uh, predator wasps. I see them carrying off all kinds of uh, pests. And uh, we have a lot of snakes that eat a lot of slugs. And so uh, everywhere we turn, we have this uh, ecosystem that I'm very happy to see every day when I walk out there. I see a new creature, insect, or reptile. I see something new every day, every time I go out there, a new plant, something I've never seen before. Such a joy compared to living in the city where everything that comes in is negative, the smells, the sounds. Of it. So <laughs> being uh, on a farm is really like, if you want your endorphins kicked in, go to a farm. So the neem oil I researched and I read that it was a systemic neurotoxin, which means, systemic means it's in every part of the organism. So if you spray it on the soil, you spray it on the leaf, wherever you spray it, it's going to be in every part of that plant, the flower, everything. So I did, couldn't figure out, I couldn't find any research on it. So with my background, I'm just assuming that that means every part of it's going to have a little of this neem oil. So if I feed this to my neighbor who's pregnant and the infant is this big and it's getting neurotoxins when it's developing, that could possibly be very bad. So um, uh, I decided to stay away from organic and go with my gut. And my gut <coughs> says if there's something bad in the soil, it can be absorbed into the plant. So a lot of the small local farmers that you have, the friends that you have that are not organic but have their own little farm, mom, pop, they're, um, they're going to eat that stuff and they don't want to contaminate their well and they don't want their animals to be hurt and they don't want to eat something very bad. So what they're growing and they're so happy growing it and seeing it come to life every spring, they want to share it and when they share it with their neighbors, they're not going to share something that they wouldn't eat themselves. Uh, it's something that they can for the winter, it's something that they hate to see go to waste, they'll feed it back to their animals, they'll can it, they'll give it to the shelters, they'll give it to the cap pro community action program here, because it's very valuable, even if it's not perfect in its appearance. Um, usually at the market you see the better looking ones, you don't see all the other ones that aren't so pretty looking. <laughs> we usually keep them. and. Uh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> you, you sell on a more personal basis. I mean, you pull up to the back of the restaurant, you sell at farmers yes. markets. And, yes. uh, again, do you get that question? Do people ask you if, if you are organic? Do you hear it all? Uh, yeah, at the farmers markets they do. At my farm stand by my house they always do. Um, constantly. I don't think they know what organic means. I'll say to them, they'll say, they won't want something because it's funny looking and I'll say, and I'll have them taste it. And this is what I do at the restaurants. I'll load up the truck with something I just picked. Because things come in all at once. And uh, I'll make them taste it. And then they'll taste the difference of something fresh and something that I grew because I went through the catalog all winter and picked out what I saw to have the best flavor uh, and certain qualities that I really like. They don't keep well. They might not keep well in package and send to the city. They might not look pretty. But, boy, you can't beat the flavor of some of this stuff. It's names of things that, uh, like lipstick peppers or something, that, that these fellas in the restaurants have only seen bell peppers. And then they've seen the color bell peppers. But they've never had a pimiento pepper. And they are so delicious, just like eating an apple. So when they come out to the truck and they see these ugly string beans that are 10 inches long and look all beanie, and then they taste one, they'll buy the whole box of them or the peppers, you know what I mean, or uh, the potatoes. The potatoes were grown in the 1800s for their flavor, the Green Mountain potatoes. And uh, now we're getting potatoes that are blue and purple inside, but no longer just white potatoes. And uh, they stopped growing them because when the Industrial Age came, potatoes were peeled by machine and had to be nice and smooth in a certain shape. So we've lost all these different flavored potatoes and colored potatoes. Uh, so um, when, well, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> you just keep going. Can I say something about the copper button? Please, please, go ahead, Richard. On public TV, I'm watching a program.
about the Egyptians, and they're trying to find this lost city. So they realize that let's look for a toxic waste dump <laughs> in the sand. So what they were looking for is copper, because that's what they worked with. And once they found the copper in the soil, that's 2,000 years ago, I guess, right? And because that's where the foundry was, now the city should be somewhere in this area. Mm. So that, and I thought of that when I was watching a program. I says, meanwhile, they're spraying copper. And that one year that was a lot of blight, that damp year, they're spraying copper. I think I don't know what the regulation. I think the copper was whatever X amount, maybe once every two weeks, once a week, whatever. Whenever it rains. Well, and it was raining every day. So they, yeah. so I know people that were just spraying it every day. The copper, and I go, wow, how's that go back to the Egyptians uh, 2,000 years from now? We'll know that field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll just say for organic that, um, first of all, there's a, um, a pest control hierarchy. So before you can use copper, you need to approve, uh, you need to, first of all, ask your certifier um, if you can use it, and then you, ha and you have to explain to them that you've done um, other control before you use copper. But copper is toxic, and so and uh, so I, I expect that in the next um, within the next ten years, which is two of the five year cycles, um, we're looking at, at products from Europe. They're looking at types of coppers that um, that break down uh, much faster and uh, alternatives to coppers. Um, so we expect, and we will be working hard to get copper out of organic. And that that's the value is that. We know it's toxic, it's got to go, and it will go. And so there wouldn't, there's no other place that you could say that in the ag system that's, that demands that it be looked at like that. It is toxic, though, and that it was quite an eye-opener during the, like, to watch those farms get. What I wanted to say also is that most of the farmers that you know in the area are older than dirt. And we are trying to encourage right now young farmers to come in like Hannah and her friends and a lot of other young farmers that you see beginning to come in the area and us older farmers and the young farmers we're learning a lot from each other um, there is a big movement uh, the local uh, farmers that farm with chemicals and the tradition the um, you know uh, college educated farmers they do use chemicals they do get a great uh, production, uh, their soil, I don't think they can even sell it to real estates for development because of the toxicity of the soil, but uh, they think that we are hippie farmers <laughs> because we live very, uh, on a very tight budget, to put it. That's a hippie farm. <laughs> One thing I want to say about um, I wonder if Hannah could introduce herself since, yes. I'm, I'm, unfortunately she wasn't on our most recent list, so I apologize. But if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> um, I'm Hannah. I am, I am leasing Ethel's property and working with her to grow vegetables there. And I'm going to be working there full time starting in, this, in the next farming season. And are you from Brooklyn as well? I'm not. I am, I am originally. That was a prerequisite to be on this <laughs> That's why my name was on the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the benefits of, of getting food locally is that, as Ethel says, she, she pulls the she pulls the produce out of the ground and she goes to the restaurant with them. Because as soon as it comes out of the ground, it has the most flavor and the most nutrition. So if you think about a product coming from China that's pulled out of the ground weeks before, even from California, and that's why it has so much flavor, and that's why the chefs are, are uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're trying to track down these farmers to get as much food as possible. Laura, you... I mean, you're a big supporter of, of using local farms, and you use it on all your promotional material. And in fact, you state you said, "I say it's seasonal and local more than I say organic." Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. And I started my career at Long Island College Hospital in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Gigi is a part of who I am. I'm not Gigi, and I like it's it's such a um, it's a, such a great platform to explore all that I believe in in terms of public health and wellness and all the, all the um, experiences that I've had over the years. But it, it is a, really just a fragment of the whole discussion, you know. And for me. I don't look at Gigi as a restaurant or a brand. I look at it as an exploration and always evolving um, what I believe in terms of good food and sharing it with people. And I've watched over the last 13 years a lot of children grow up in the restaurant. And um, you know, I've had parents you know, lament to me that their child's first word was Gigi, which is easy for me. <laughs> palettes and develop them and help them explore flavors and flavors in season. Mm -hmm. And I think seasonality that really comes to me from when I lived in Italy. I started as a nutritionist. I went to a culinary school. I worked um, very much in clinical care and nutrition in New York City for a number of years. Went to the French Culinary Institute. Um, something was wrong and I saw it right there. I saw that um, I was seeing people after many, many years of dietary neglect, um, and then the doctor writes an order and they say, go see this patient who has just had an amputation from long-term diabetes or heart disease or, um, and at that time, a lot of immunosuppressed type of um, conditions and things, symptoms um, related to bad eating patterns over a very, very long period of time. And that's what really convinced me that, you know, to be an effective nutritionist, and life is a journey that never goes linear, I thought I would go to culinary school to be a better nutritionist. And it's really, to me, odd to end up so much in the food world. Um, but I also feel like it's one of the most effective ways that I can be an, a public health educator. Um, I, when I was at the French Culinary Institute, I was, it's all, it was all about technique, and I was surrounded by master French chefs that, you know, by day I was telling people, and this was at the time when nutrition was oat bran, margarine instead of butter, um, you know, just all these crazy concepts, no eggs, you know, like, you know, two eggs a week or whatever it was that was mandated by the American Heart Association. And I'm telling people this stuff by day, and then I'm going to the French Culinary Institute at night, and the food tastes so good, and I'm clarifying butter, and I'm reducing cream, and I'm doing, like, learning all these techniques, and there was just, like, such a separation between um, this feeling right and being educated to tell people this. And I think sort of the street that I've traveled has sort of merged them, and one of the things that really solidified it was moving to Italy for a year and realize, and eating fantastic cheeses. and. Um, all foods in good proportion, um, natural foods in good portions. And that really, to me, between, I think, it's helped gel my background in health and wellness and food and made me realize that it's really not about cooking by numbers or eating by numbers. It's about eat, selecting good ingredients and good food and also making that community part of eating, like sitting at a table sharing experiences with people through food. Um, I think in a, as a big public health measure, um, that has to come back. And like when I write or I teach about nutrition and I do all the other stuff outside of Gigi, one of my biggest focuses is to share the experience of eating and also like the techniques of cooking because if we focus on like a certain ingredient in a certain season, I just like someone to know when they go to the farmer's market what do they do with a kohlrabi, or what do they do with like something that you may grow that is so foreign to them? And just opening up. Once you know how to work with specific ingredients, you have like a whole exploration of ingredients that can be yours. And I'm not, even though I write a lot of recipes, I'm not a big believer in recipes. I'm a believer that if you show people a few techniques, it should inspire something within them to make them own the recipe or own the dish. And that could change from one week to the next, depending on what's growing in your herb garden or what you see in the farmer's market. 
So a big part of what I've really enjoyed doing is taking my background in public health and helping people liberate themselves as their own inner cook and being able to support local growers and ranchers and, and go see what they have and have an idea of how to work it into their lifestyle and to share the flavors with especially young people. Mm -hmm. I've been um, part of uh, Healthy Children, Healthy Futures, which is a national um, after school eating program uh, since 2000 and it was recently the, the woman who developed it has recently branded the program to the American Academy of Nutrition um, but it was a great after school program that really got the idea was to get to children young with like eight habits of healthy kids that was what the whole thing was based on and you know the, the measures are broad and the messages are broad and I think you can, you can take it, you can go on a really narrow level, like we need to eat organically, seasonally, locally. But as one, if people did one thing to eat more natural food and, and fruits and vegetables, and I think the messaging to people has to be broad. And then, you know, I mean, obviously everybody in this room has a really strong interest in natural and organic foods. Um, but there are a lot of people out there, like we're in a utopia here. <laughs> you know, it, it's what we what we experience every day and what we have available to us is far different than what the average American has, and I think that's something to keep in mind. That, like, you know, we need, and that's why I gravitate, as you had just brought up, towards the seasonal and local message because there's a ritual about eating seasonal foods. Like, and I, this is something that I grew to adore in Italy is like just that looking forward to the white asparagus in May, looking forward to that first strawberry, the first cherry. I mean, it doesn't mean the same thing if you get it year-round. If you get it when it's just perfect, it just it's like a marker in time and something that you share and it's something that excitement grows around. And for me, that's um, I think that's one of the catches that like can help change the way a, you know a larger group of Americans eat. That and flavor, just putting good food on the plate. That um, I forgot who was talking about just tasting people. Yes, you're, you're yeah. talking about your chefs, that you just taste them on stuff. It's the same thing with any other consumer at the farmer's market. I'm sure you see that, Richie, with your oh, products. All the time, uh, you know. But, let me, you know, we're saying a lot, but uh, I was, uh, sorry to interrupt. No. But we have to go in defense of we're never going to get away from the sprays and the chemicals. I don't see that it ever happened. You know, we have to face reality. You know, I, I joke about my father with the, the two apples, but if you ever saw what an organic apple looks like, come to my farm maybe every third year, that's when I get a crop, okay? Uh, if you saw the way those apples look when they're not sprayed, most of you people won't eat them, okay? You gotta wipe them off. I mean, so what my father said at that time was in some ways true. Before the Second World War, there was a lot of crop failures. You know, we didn't have the chemicals. And while they were talking, I was thinking about Pete Sturgis, who the Sturgis family were newcomers that came here 1625 on their own schooner. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, Pete Jr. passed away uh, a year ago. But um, when I would love to talk to his father, his father had a terrific memory. He can explain to me how the market hunters used to leave Tivoli, go to hunt three days toward Elizaville and in three days back and then bring all their game onto the, the steamship and go to New York City. And he could tell a guy's name, you know, I can't remember, who's it? My wife, what's her name again? <laughs> so, but, but what he said is that, you know, when he was younger and, they, and they've had these orchards forever, and uh, he says, you know, we only sprayed maybe two or three times a year. I said, how's that? He says, well, the chemicals that we used, that's all we needed to do. Now, we'll, you know, he's, she cringes, you know, oh my God, but chemicals, right? It's true. But are, are we ahead of the game when you see these guys spraying every week? And, you know, so, uh, because supposedly the chemicals that are not organic, I'm talking about that, that they use uh, still breaks down or whatever it is. You know, the problem here I see is the chemical companies figure it out, listen, uh, one time when there was an exterminator in Brooklyn going by and I was kidding me, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm killing the bugs, you know, roaches, right? So I says, uh, but I see you going there every week. He says, oh yeah, well, you know, we kill three but leave one. <laughs> that's, that's the theory to the chemical companies. 
So we may be losing uh, the toxicity maybe on some of these chemicals, but the, the farmers have to spray more often and they're more expensive. Um, they can probably tell you, you know, and the orchard's got to show me a little vial like this they put in there and it's, I don't know, $1,800 or 18, whatever, it's a lot of money. So, and they have to spray it continuously. Now, do you think that we're ever going get, to get away from that? I don't think so, because the United States supplies, you think so? You think so? Oh. I'm hoping. Like, well, it's, it, yeah, uh, hoping, and you know, we will always In Europe, that, they've, but, uh, they're way ahead of us. In Europe, they ban GMOs. And, uh, they're trying, the European Union is trying to ban GMOs. Uh, Here, we uh, can't even get them labeled so right. that we know what's in it. Well, I, I, so, I don't disagree with you, but I'm, what I'm saying is that I can't <laughs> see that we're, yeah, but when, when Europe wants food, where do they come to? They grow a lot of it. We have, but you know, we, we, we feed uh, the world. A lot of countries will not buy American food because of our our uh, agricultural practices. A lot of countries will not buy GMO. A lot of countries will not buy uh, uh, our grains, our meats, because uh, they, they just won't do it. Um, so, but the local people, I have teachers, school teachers from Brooklyn, that <laughs> and Queens, they come to my stand and they've never heard of a GMO. They say, well, I'll say, oh, this is, they say, are you organic? I say, oh, absolutely, we don't have any GMOs. We don't grow GMOs. They go, what's a GMO? And this is like a nearly retired school teacher. I'm like, this, this, um, <laughs> just, I, I don't understand. Just with respect to GMOs and yeah. grains and like this uh, screamingly high number of people following gluten-free yeah. practices, yes. I don't think, um, and, I, and it's something that has to be addressed within the business of food, and you know, certainly something I've adjusted my business to. We have gluten-free skizza, we have gluten-free gnocchetti, we have a whole wide variety of products that, are, and my servers are trained to tell people exactly which products contain gluten or not. We no longer thicken any sort of um, sauce with flour. As a nutritionist, like there's, I have mixed feelings about it. Like there's, there's definitely an issue. Um, there's. I think um, some people that use it more is like at Atkins diet, like a low carb diet, and that's a very small group of people. I think there's people with real issues and they've been actually, like sometimes I'll ask the customer, well how, how long have you been di diagnosed with celiac disease? Disease? I don't have a disease. Like, I'm like, okay, <laughs> no. So that's not, you know, it's not, a, the only way you really know if you have celiac is you have a gut biopsy. So. But there is an issue with people that can't tolerate gluten, and that maybe they don't have celiac disease. I don't. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but I do know a lot of these people travel to Europe, and they can eat grains, pasta, pizza, whatever, and they have no issue whatsoever. Yeah. Can I just say what I read yesterday? And I don't believe everything I read, and I did send it on to see if there's research that it's really not a gluten problem. It's a problem of spraying the wheat four days before it goes into the reaper or the thrasher because it holds up better and doesn't get this stuck in the machine. machine. With Roundup, uh, round oh. yeah, specifically Roundup. So that's po that's a possibility of that of the problem. Before we go on to any questions, I, I just want to uh, just let Jennifer speak, and uh, because she is on the, the, the education end of teaching about nutrition at Mother Earth, which is an amazing health food store, which I love to shop in. And, and what? Why do you think people are coming to you to? For educational purposes, is it something because someone's sick and they want to want to have a better um, diet? Yeah, they're or? not necessarily coming for educational purposes. They're coming to, to do their shopping. But um, it's just to backtrack a little bit. I do um, we do healthy edgy eating education events and um, people and we demonstrate food that's usually in season and things have themes that are appropriate to the time of year and. Um, we sort of set up a table and we give out samples. So back to the taste thing of trying to bring people in via tasting things to know that how good it is to eat things that are in season and healthy and good for you. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are people looking for when, when they come into your yeah, store? Because you're basically yeah, on, on the education. A lot of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a lot of gluten-free people. I mean, as you 
mentioned, it's wildly popular and trendy right now. So many, many, many people come in because they know they can get a lot of gluten-free pastas and packaged goods and things like that. Um, we've tried to teach people that if they want to be gluten-free, there are other ways to approach it, not just by buying gluten-free cookies, but by cooking lots of healthy fruits and vegetables and just sort of like shifting your focus a little bit. Even though we sell those packaged gluten-free cookies, but, we, but with what I do and my colleague does, we are just trying to get people to learn a little bit more about mm -hmm. things you can do. Well, someone with, with the gluten-free, it's like I remember growing up, it's just not something we ever heard. An issue. Yeah. So this is really came about in the last 10 years, possibly, and, and how did yes, that, it's a new you know, thing. suddenly develop? Um, I mean, this is something that, that's fairly new. Is it something that's come up in our system? In other words, are, did people have this problem before? When I worked or, in it, not as much. No. Well, that's, no. that's my point, yeah. No, when I worked in acute clinical care at New York Hospital, Memorial Sloan Kettering, in the mid 90s, early 90s, very, very few patients that we saw had gluten celiac disease. It's very rare. rare. Right. It, and I now it's, it's a, I would even give it like more than 10% of our customers at the restaurant mm -hmm. express an interest in gluten free products. Yeah, yeah, I mean, go to a bake shop, it's like gluten free. You know, that's, that's, that's the new buzzword besides organic. Yeah. It's gluten free and not. Is that a <coughs> You talk about buzzword and language, and the issue of of how uh, uneducated we are as a, as a public about what we have. Mm -hmm. What is gluten? Would somebody mind telling me? It's a protein <laughs> in grains. It's, a, it's you know when you uh, when you make bread and it gets nice and stretchy and elastic. You develop the gluten. You work the um, the protein in the bread. So people allergies really only relate to proteins. The body's mm -hmm. reacting against a protein, and it's just an inflammatory response to a foreign uh, protein that they don't recognize. Um, when people say they're allergic to something else, it's more, more or less an intolerance, like, like lactose is an intolerance. It's not an allergy. Unless they're allergic to a certain, because that's a sugar. If they're allergic to the protein in milk, then that would be an allergy. So gluten is a protein that's found in uh, Products. So we've been Specific eating grain bread products. for 5,000 years, and suddenly in the last 10 or 15 politically charged years of talking about these things, we now 10% of us have a gluten intolerance. I would, I would say intolerance is the best word because um, it's not an allergy. Yeah. But is it a physical intolerance or is it a political intolerance? <laughs> or is it something well, we didn't know we had? Or is it something we didn't know Or we also had? genetic modification is about shooting it's proteins it's into, um, and, and it's not an exact science. And uh, there have been no long-term, there have been no independent health studies, much less long-term health studies, about the effects. And, but the bottom line is it's, uh, it's an imperfect shooting of, of miscellaneous. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gluten is in wheat. And, okay. and other grains. And some other grains. And yeah. some other grains. So we've been making bread out of grains for 5,000 years or more. And we've been eating it. Now suddenly, how come I got gluten or I don't got gluten? We don't know. It's we not the same. GMO it's because not all the wheat is not GMO. Monsanto has been developing uh, GMO, uh, what they call BT corn, BT soy. And they take a gene out of a bacteria that creates poison. And they splice it into the corn and they splice it into the soy so that when a bug attacks the corn or the soy, it releases that toxin and the bug either dies or says, I'm out of here. Well, what's the difference between a bug eating the corn and the, corn and the poison being released or a machine going through and harvesting it? The attack is the same. You know, that, it, well, it's, it's not the I machine, think. it's us. Yeah. That's my well, theory as well. What a machine when the we digest it. It's releasing this, this poison oh, yeah. in defense. And it's like the canary in a coal mine. You know, there's some people that are more susceptible. And I think eventually... You know, and I think there's a lot of people out there that are just generally uncomfortable, but they don't really tie it into, like, identify what it is that they're eating that's making them uncomfortable. I, I, uh, the point that I have is that, uh, and most people have right now in America, because we're starting at the bottom of the whole GMO thing, is to make uh, companies uh, write on a label if it's genetically modified, so we can have a choice. So when I'm trying to figure out why I'm waking up with a sinus headache, 
Is it because of something that's been uh, spliced into my canola rapeseed and, I, and I'm sensitive to rapeseed because uh, whatever, it's toxic at, at higher levels. You know what I mean? It's sometimes genetically spliced into with another plant DNA and I might be sensitive to that. I understand all yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying yeah. to understand. He's just what getting on the gluten. What is the simple definition of gluten? That's all yeah, yeah, I yeah. ask. Yes. It's a protein yeah. in wheat. It yeah. was naturally right, right. occurring. Some other Thank you. you. And it's an autoimmune great. reaction that we have to some proteins. You could be allergic, you could be have an autoimmune reaction to meat. Red meat. Chicken. Uh, me, lady. No, not you, but it's very rare, but it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Especially rare meat. I don't have an autoimmune reaction. What Laura just said, because recently, well, not well, but recent, I went with a friend again to Italy who has been at the gastroenterologist for four years and they're trying to figure out what the problem is. And she was worried about the diet there, but all the pasta and all the bread. And and I remember at the second day we were there, she said, I don't know, Carol, I'm going to have to tell my doctor, but nothing bothers me here. The fire has gone out. That's the difference between our food. Yeah. Please, Kathy. Uh, well, I don't know where to start in this day, but I'm, I'm a certified dietitian nutritionist in New York State. And I must say that this whole GMO issue, I think I just didn't want to go there. And then I went to a program six months ago at New Paltz on this genetic modification of crops, which sent me on my own exploration. And it's a, it's a, it's a scary thing, and I'm trying to figure out how to say what I want to say quickly. It's a double whammy because you have eight crops in the United States, mostly commodity crops, that are 75 to 80% of our processed foods, which are the corn, the corn, the soy, the corals, canola, the beet sugar, and cottonseed oil. And now potatoes. They've just added potatoes. OK. And there's that whole splicing in, which is a problem of its own. But the BT um, and corn, and then there's the herbicide Roundup, Roundup Ready, right? Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soy. And it's the glyphosate and the Roundup that is the other double whammy. Because if I plant Roundup Ready corn as a farmer, then if I have a problem with all these weeds, down the middle of my corn row, and I don't want to run. So what I do is I spray Roundup on everything. And now the corn, as well, is going to absorb the glyphosate. And they're finding that glyphosate is a biggie problem. It is not non-toxic. And it's a it's a long story. We Isn't it reading. from uh, Agent Orange? It's like right. that's a, that's a whole that's, that's a new one. That's a, that's a, that's a new one introducing. Okay. <laughs> but Monsanto said glyphosate is not toxic because we can't metabolize it. It is the um, it's only the plants that metabolize it through the and I'm sorry I can't remember this pathway. And come to find out, our gut bacteria also have this pathway. So the glyphosate is affecting, so it ends up affecting your GI system because it's the gut bacteria that processes and metabolizes the glyphosate. So therefore, and it goes on from there, which I really just can't keep going with all that kind of chemistry type of thing. But apparently, this is at the heart of it. And then when you mention about the sugar and the wheat, and I don't know if anti-caking, I'm hoping it's not what you mean regarding them spraying Roundup on wheat, oats, lentils, mm -hmm. sugar cane as what they call a desiccant. And it dries, number one, it ripens the, the, the plant faster and it dries it out, and it makes it more suitable for refinement. But meanwhile, we're eating sugar, or sugarcane sugar that is not organic, 
that has been sprayed with Monsanto's Roundup. That's what the Roundup. Uh, no, I'm not. I don't use this. But from what I gather, Roundup is um, a key. well. It, it works with photosynthesis, right. so it kills the plant and dries it, and that's why probably they put it on wheat to dry it quickly to crop at oh. one time. So normally they wouldn't. Now Roundup Ready product, I believe, is that you could spray the corn, and it won't die from the wheat no, will it die. Won't die die because it, it has a protection or absorb, but it does not die from. I mean, there's so much that goes mm -hmm. on, you know, it's never ending. It's, for instance, uh, a, a doctor came by, and I'm feeding the goats, you know, and, um, you know, he said, oh, did I tell you my nephew was working for Entimates for the summer? I said, oh, I guess so, I don't pay attention, I'm just <laughs> throwing corn out there. And he says, oh, and, you know, they're um, bringing uh, the day-old cakes to Mr. Brand X Chicken. So I said, oh, yeah, I see him advertising on the TV that he puts dandelions, gives him dandelions and gives him cakes, right? So I says, oh, I, what amazes me is that, what do they do, sit at the end of the tractor trailer ripping those boxes open <laughs> and feeding the cakes? And it's not labor efficient. He said, no, 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 I want to tell you, I went down there and I went for a ride with him. They bring the tractor trailer over. He says, and they got a ramp that's on an angle. He opens up his doors. He, backs up real fast, and he hits the brakes, and everything comes out. I says, and? And it goes in this machine, grinds it all. I said, okay, 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 doctor. Let's stop right here. Now I stop feeding the goats. Let's forget about the paper, which is organic. Well, so, all right, you know, it's a tree, right? Let's forget about the dye. Who cares? Okay, we get a little dye from the little lettering all on it. Okay. And that little clear lens that we're looking through, probably a petroleum byproduct, right? You know, <laughs> forget about that. What about the pie plates? Oh, this thing's terrific. It crunches those up. <laughs> That's my point. I says, you're a doctor. You know what a, you know what a chicken's like? <laughs> it's got a gizzard in there. I says, now you just said something to me. It brought a light up in my I says, so you give me a pill of a loom. I swallow it. Pass it through my system. I'll probably absorb it. I don't know. Well, Ten parts per thousand, I don't know. But you put some aluminum in a chicken's gizzard. Anybody know what a chicken gizzard is? It's a muscle that helps grind the grain. They, they pick up the sand, the sand, stones, they put in there to help grind it, okay? So this muscle works like this. Now the aluminum's in there in little pieces, and they're grinding it up. They're absorbing a million times per million. I don't know, but they're really absorbing. Now, you guys were talking about cooking with aluminum pots. They're talking about the connection with Alzheimer's and aluminum in our system. What's a better way than to eat Brand X's chicken with aluminum in it? Well, he leaves me, runs up to the sort house. My wife was waiting on his wife, who happens to be a, a, a nurse, and he goes, Don't buy Brand X no more. <laughs> he says, and you see, what I'm, what the point I'm making is we're getting inundated by all different ways that we have no idea, okay? The, well, when you add, that's where I came back to my theory, you come back and figure out what you had in your lifetime. You know, even the medications, you know, my mother's 93 years old, and, and uh, you know, so she takes different medications, and all of a sudden the, the insurance company says that you've got to use uh, a different, the same chemical, but made somewhere else, you know, uh, yeah. probably China. And, and the doctor goes, it's the same chemicals in here. Why are you having, you, you can't be having a reaction, you know? And she says, I am, I can't take it. It's whatever it was. He says, you can't. I says, Mom, look at the inert, inert, what is it, inert? Inert. 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 It's different. It's different. And that's the problem. It's not, it's not the drugs that you're taking. It's the filler. Now, and, you know, so when you get down to it, Let's go for a drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any questions for the panel? I'm oh, sorry. Yes, um, I, it, um, all, a lot of these points brings me back to policy. I'm a policy wonk. And uh, addressing the idea that we'll never do without sprays, but also the idea of what's it, what is in our food. Um, just a fact that probably more than anything keeps me going in federal policy, which is really like beating your head against a wall constantly, I, is that your tax dollars pay for our food system, um, our industrial food system. 
in lots of different ways. It incentivizes chemical agriculture and it pays subsidies to, uh, to the largest industrial uh, growers, but also um, pays for research. Um, the only research really that gets done on agriculture is in uh, the chemical industry and um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's massive research apparatus. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, we use we spend about three percent, probably less than three percent, but right around there, of all of our USDA research dollars on anything that can be characterized organic. That's up from 1990. It was point. Uh, it was one percent of all the USDA dollars. So looking for transparency, you know, doing those studies about health effects and looking for the alternatives as when are we going to find something that um, helps us grow our apples organically in the Hudson Valley. We, don't, we can't do it now because we're not investing in it and because we are spending so little. A, a country like Cuba, when they went with the downfall of the Soviet Union and they had no um, ability to pay for chemical pesticides, put all of their research dollars into looking at the alternatives. And, and some of it was looking back at how we, farm, uh, how we used to farm organically, but organic agriculture is not the old way we do farming, per se. It is taking the wisdom of these farmers and um, trying it out. It's different in different uh, climates and microclimates, but it's taking that research and seeing if we can find those systems that work. But 3% of our USDA dollars are spent on looking to those alternatives. That's part of the problem. The system is really broken there. And we're so fortunate to hear about your alternatives and, and your insights into what works. But um, as a country looking at our food supply, we're not. We, we will not see it on the, the media. Mm -hmm. You won't see anything much on the media. There's no education in the schools. Our young farmers, most of the young farmers have a college education. And so, uh, they have a lot more insight than uh, uh, people who do not work with food. Um, the book, Organic, uh, I notice has, has the chefs also. I think the learning uh, um, areas are at these restaurants. I know a lot of the, uh, a few of the local restaurants are what they call uh, local work type of eating. They will cook seasonal. They will use the seasonal stuff. They won't use salt and pepper. They'll, they don't even have a salt and pepper shaker on the table most of the time or sugar. They'll have, uh, they'll, the, the food itself has such a wonderful flavor and their herbs, they season it with herbs and other vegetables and other plant matter that, that we have, that we grow, uh, like lovage. Um, you won't find lovage in the supermarket. Uh, things like that. So going to a restaurant like Murray's or uh, buying at a local farmer's market. Um, so like this book, all, most of us know each other because we're, we're like-minded. And when we do have time off, some of us will even get together for dinners. We were getting together with uh, kids from, that graduated the Culinary Institute and were working at the restaurants uh, for the chefs uh, preparing the foods. And we would cook together once a week, uh, Tuesday nights, because that's when they had off. And so Tom and I would harvest, and we'd have like five or six chefs come over, and uh, they would, uh, we would present them with what we grew. And they were so sick of cooking the same thing all week because when you cook on the line, you make a thousand of these, a thousand of those. So, and what do the chefs do on their day off? They cook. They cook. <laughs> so, what do farmers do on their day off? They read a seed magazine. You know, it's just we're twenty. It's what we are. So, um, they would cook things. Uh, a piece of fish that was locally caught. They would cook it in like five different ways, you know, for everybody to taste. And it wasn't a negative word. It wasn't like chopped or, yeah. <laughs> they had something good to say about everything. And they learned ingredients that, uh, that I was uh, sourcing out for new products uh, that grew in our climate. And so they would try different things and different varieties of things. And so the, they're presenting those things to their chefs. And so, Sometimes that's the way to learn 
not when the media is not cooperating, it's by word of mouth, you know, uh, one to one. Mm -hmm. At the farmers market, we do a lot of teaching. When anybody asks, I, I why don't you grow your own? They complain about the price of garlic. The farmers are trying to earn a living wage right now, and it's very hard because the cost of living is so high in this area. So when they say nine dollars a pound, twelve dollars a pound, I can get three for that, three for whatever five dollars at Adam. I say I haven't grown, I haven't bought garlic in twenty eight years. I says why don't you grow some? <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's the first thing that comes up in the spring. You can even eat, start eating the leaves if you plant enough of it. You know. <laughs> I you know last year, out. the organic industry in the U.S. alone was at thirty-five billion dollars. And I don't know about. I've never seen Richard. I've never seen you come in on your private jet. <laughs> well, they won't let me land. <laughs> Talk, I always think, you know, people talk about that, they talk about the cost of organic food. I mean, for me, throughout my life, it's like, if I'm going to put it in my body, I really don't care how much it costs. When I go see my doctor every year to get a physical, I always say, I don't care how much you charge me, as long as you tell me I'm fine, I'm going to walk out of here happy. But oh, I, think, I wasn't going to tell him about yeah, that. Well, what, what's expensive, get into our medical system and end up in a hospital. Yeah. Then you'll be talking about what expensive is, and you'll realize for me to have nutritious food, I mean, we have to think about what is food and why do we eat. Food is to, to nurture ourselves, to make us healthy, to keep us healthy. That's the whole point of it. And it starts with kids. Yeah, and it starts with kids, and that, that is a great thing. I mean, what you're doing, and you start to see it about a young age, and you know, we're, we're just so fortunate to live in this region. I mean, this, this is amazing. I'm sure probably everyone in here lives in this area, and there's few areas like this in the country where we have access to this type of food and farmers and chefs who just who really, really care about what they're doing and the food that they're, they're giving to us. So yes. for me to give them a few extra dollars, I am just like more than happy. I mean, I notice people don't complain about their cell phone bills or their cable bills and that's fine, but I'm going to like complain because I have to pay an extra two dollars for, for a head of broccoli that I know is just, you know, is going to taste amazing. Um, so. Yeah, I think part of the reason why there's only three percent given to organic is companies like Monsanto that make these GMOs and these poisons. Uh, they give a lot of money to our politicians in the reelection campaign. Yes, yeah. and in, in the process, that more and more people are being ex Monsanto employees are being appointed to USDA, mm -hmm. and yeah. they're also the FDA. So. It's like, you know, how, how can you fix a problem when the people at the top don't think it's a problem? Education. They, they think it's money. Education. The people will not buy it if we educate them. It's yeah. from the grassroots. If you yes. really want to have, you know, just get a taste of what's going on, on online there's a video called Patent for a Pig. And it's a real eye opener. It's how Monsanto developed a gene for pigs that made more bacon. And they just put it out there. And every, every, you know, when you get a, a pig that makes more bacon than what he wants. So they just let out there was breeding. Mm -hmm. All these pigs now have this gene. And then they started taking farmers to court saying they own every pig out there that has this gene because they developed it. And the farmers are fighting and they're losing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're going bankrupt. And Monsanto is making them use their corn, which is going to fertility problems and pigs, and it's like, you know, the, the problem is not organic. The problem is the USDA and the FDA and lobbying. Right. If you really want to fix something, mm -hmm. those are the things you've got to fix. Otherwise, you're trying to shovel a, a pile of dirt with a shovel while somebody with a backhoe is, is putting it it's, it's a long fight, but yeah. as Deanna said, it's something that we might not even see it in our lifetime. You know, I mean, the way farmers talk, you know, we, we they farm in a sustainable way so that the next generation could farm land. And I think it's the same thing. I mean, we can't stop fighting to try to get GMOs labeled in this country. Um, hopefully it will happen, because I think if we look at the health of our country, it's rather dismal. We pay more in health care than any other country in the world, yet we rank like 29th in terms of the healthiest nation. So, again, our health is something we can't stop fighting for. You know, we're fighting for energy, and uh, I can't see that 
we, we, we should go to other countries and we should be sourcing food from China, from Mexico, from South America. We shouldn't be doing that. I mean, the backbone of this country are farmers and farming. Um, and we can't end that. I mean, in New York State alone, after the Second World War, there were approximately 150,000 farms. Okay, today we have about 36,000. So if you think about that, we've lost an average of 1,600 farms every year for the past 70 years. So Why? What's that? Why? Money. Money. Farmland became more valuable. It became more just uh, for, from, a, from a cost standpoint so to sell your land to build buildings. We have less than 2% of the population producing food for 100 and, uh, 310 or 15 million of us mm -hmm. with a surplus. Yeah. So how do we tie all of this together on a kind of a bleary November afternoon? I'll finish in just a little bit, if I may. Um, when we have the issue of politics, and I've heard we don't have health care, we don't have education, our children don't have jobs, etc. My concern and my passion is for Red Hook. How do we make the first small step here in Red Hook together? Because what I believe is it's a political issue. Indeed, this gentleman got it. It's a political issue and it's driven by it's driven by the the, the God of capitalism, which we all bow down to and we've all benefited greatly from. But my point is we need to reach a balance, and that balance can only begin neighbor to neighbor and community to community. So I would urge all of us to kind of continue this conversation in a, and especially when you go to vote, you got to think about whom you're voting for, and you got to look down deep into the issues and what these people stand for or don't. That's my point. I think I it's a political issue. It's very complicated. I agree totally. I think it's so important. Like this, this movement here is really happening. It's where I don't have any faith that we can change the top. But I think we would, if, if we have, if I have any faith, it's right here in this room, you know, and how we're getting together and talking about this and the, the grassroots thing. And I think unique in this area is what what's happening here, but even more unique is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to spread out. And well, I agree. I agree. I think uh, it's, it's a really special thing. Um, I just wanted to follow up what Chris was saying, too. And I like the word grassroots. Um, I'm a fruit grower and a small fruit grower, but we do have to use apples and pears. It's harder to grow them than vegetables. And um, just in the sense that you invest something, I always love the saying, plant pears for your heirs. That you're planting a tree and you invest so much in it and you have the same pest coming back every year. The number one scare is fire blight, which um, can destroy your whole tree and it's, it's a lot. But I, whenever people come to our farm market, and I think I'm always happy that I try to be there a lot because I feel like people want to know your farmer. And there's always this conception that we like to spray, which I'm always like. <laughs> um, my husband always says, like, we have right now, apples respond differently to different pesticides. And we have Newtown Pippin. We grow a lot of antique varieties. That apples like loves every summer disease that's possible. It is covered with sooty blotch, with fly speck, with, it's disgusting. And my husband says to people, we spend thousands of dollars so it doesn't look like this for you, but all you have to do is spit on it and wipe it off. All, if you, you just spit and we'll, you know, we could all be a lot happier. But people do buy with their eyes and there are things that we need to do to protect. But I tell all our customers, as you said, farming, I think we're even less than that. I think we're only half percent of the population right now. We don't have a voice to all of these big lobbyists. We need for all of the other people to say, we don't want pesticides. Believe me, my husband and I do not want pesticides. But we aren't going to be able to provide you with apples and peaches and pears right now if we can't. There's a lot of Asian invasion of, uh, we have, I can't even remember the name, spotted wing drosophila. This year we did not harvest any of our fall raspberries or blackberries. We lost it to that pest because we chose not to spray insecticides on our fruit. We don't like to spray the fruit. We do spray the blossoms more than the fruit. So we lost that. But these are things that are coming from Asia that are 
we're not ready to control. And I know there's a big issue right now in California with the citrus industry that organic farmers might be forced to spray. Did any of you hear any of this? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know the specifics. Because of the citrus industry in Florida has been so damaged with an insect invasion, right? From, so yeah, it's yeah, citrus greening. But I'm just saying, please tell the government more research, more research. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, you know, there, there's an example on the, on the antibiotics um, used for fire blight. Again, non-fruit, by the way. Um, but there has been no other alternative. There's a guy in um, Washington State who has a yeast product alternative, completely natural. Um, and he went to USDA for three years in a row for money, and they would not give it to him. And then there was this big uh, outcry when um, my groups were fighting to get rid of antibiotic use in organic, um, and they finally funded him. But it, those, the, he needs a, a timeline. He, he, these things are not um, instant, especially as chemicals are. The, you know, a yeast alternative, it takes a lot of uh, research. And, um, and they're doing it in Washington State, and they're actually not doing it in the East. You know, that alternative is barely available here for anyone in the East um, because they're not investing in it. And, we're, uh, and I would say, as much as the grassroots, which I am a grassroots organizer and a believer in that, we also have to uh, vote uh, and work at the highest levels to demand that, we, that our tax dollars go in the right places. Mm -hmm. It's the way we spend our dollars. I mean, when you go to a supermarket, they know how you're spending your money, and if you keep buying organic products, they're gonna they're gonna put more money and invest in that even more. If you keep buying junk, well, they're gonna keep making it. it is That's where the money is. It is supply and demand, and yeah. I see. I work with um, Just Salad in New York. It's a collection of 20 quick service chopped salad eateries, and I see a lot of young people that work in the stores, and a lot of young people that hang out in the stores after school, as opposed to going to Kentucky Fried Chicken or McDonald's or whatever. And I really, I work with a lot of young people, both at the restaurant and in New York, and I see a standard change of what they're willing to accept for food. You know, there's a threshold that I think young people, and that's the really encouraging thing. I don't know how much is going to happen with like, you know, we've got like a, a blocked political system, and we've got a lot of issues that have to like be broken down before we can really address a lot of what you've talked about. Mm -hmm. But young people are going to create the demand for better food. It's starting, like I really feel like they have, um, the bar is a lot higher for them than what they demand in terms of their food. Mm -hmm. Um, Juliet of Red Hook Pan made me promise to remind people that there is a reception meeting starting at 3.30. So okay, what time is it now? It's 3.35. Okay. So, so, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can have questions. Yes. 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 May I have one, one uh, yes. Yes. Two, yes. Please, two please. simple actions please, everybody can do? Um, one, join the Young Farmers of America. It's a new group that's, uh, I think that's the name, right? National Young Farmers Coalition. Yeah, the Young Farmers Coalition, the National Young Farmers Coalition, which has um, been in, the, in Hardy Roots. And two, if you like today, come back again, but join today, Historic Red Hook. Okay, we need part two. <laughs> Mark, yeah, sorry I'm late. I, I got mixed up. I thought it was over there. And, uh, by the way, this is Mark Adams. He is on the Farm Road of Dutch yeah. County. No, that's right. We're the guys that cut the tails off the cows, right? No, but all, all I want to say, you know, is it, it's all about money because people are just obsessed with cheap food in this country. And if, until we can get people to understand that food is going to cost more money because all of these chemicals, GMOs, everything is about saving money. People don't, and you know, you don't spray because you love to spray. They're trying to save money, make food cheaper. Unless we can get people to understand they have to pay more of their total income for food, it's gonna, like every other country in the world, it's gonna be very difficult to get past this issue. So, you know, let's not, let's try to understand that we can't have cheap food. We have to have healthy, nutritious food, right. not cheap food. Right. That's all I have. Uh, I guess we'll conclude for today, and you know this is a conversation I just can go on for hours and hours.